So welcome back everybody to episode 36 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be about boson sampling. If you have any questions, please send us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right of the bottom of the screen. Please also note that what you're seeing on YouTube as live is about 30 seconds uh, delayed with respect to us. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Valentina who will introduce our speaker today. Very good. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to me today to introduce uh, Fabio Sciarino. Uh, so Fabio Sciarino is a full professor in physics department at Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, he is also deputy rector for the International Competitive Research Strategy at Sapienza University of Rome and a senior fellow and deputy director of Scuola Superiore di Studi Avanzata Sapienza. So uh, Fabio is the principal investigator of the Quantum Information Lab at the Department of Physics. And his main expertise is the experimental quantum optics, computation and quantum information and foundation of quantum mechanics. So in recent year, uh, Fabio uh, has focused on the implementation of quantum information protocol via integrated photonic circuits uh, with particular interest uh, for boson sampling that we heard about today. And which is, as he is going to explain, universal computational model uh, with promise characteristic to achieve the quantum supremacy regime. So he's currently coordinator of the European FET Open Project Focusing, and he has, he has been awarded as a principal investigator of ERC grant, advanced grant, uh, or with the name QBOS. And with that, I leave the stage to uh, Fabio. So thank you so much for this invitation. It's a pleasure being here with you online. And so today I would like to review, to have a present to review on the last experiments on quantum advantage, quantum supremacy with photonic platforms. So really thank you once again for this initiative which brings us together as a community. And my goal is really to, to show you an overview of the framework, trying to give you all the foundations on this topic. So this is another slide in my talk. I would like to briefly review the concept of quantum supremacy. We will then see how we can try to demonstrate quantum supremacy the photonics approach, we will then jump on the other side of the talk, which is integrated quantum photonics, and I will briefly review all the recent experiment on boson sampling, and we focus mostly on how I work in Rome, but it also we describe works by other groups all over the world. So let's very briefly introduce the concept of quantum supremacy, and to this purpose, we should introduce the computational complexity classes. We know that we have this potential of quantum computing where we have different complexity classes, and we know that quantum computing is in principle different from classical computing. But we also know that this is something on the theoretical side, then moving on the lab and being able to really demonstrate a speed up of quantum versus classical is a very challenging task. So we know that we have several challenges when we deal with quantum computing. We will have qubits which strongly interact in order to elaborate information. We will have qubits that should not interact with the environment. And we need to have a full control on the interaction between the qubit and the measurement capability. In all these different requirements, a key role is played by noise. If you want to overcome the role of noise, you need to have quantum error correction, but this requires sophisticated schemes and a scalable quantum computing is possible only if errors are below some threshold. Moreover, carrying out quantum error correction requires a large overhead in the number of qubits and in the number of gates. So now we have a challenge, is can we engineer a quantum system to perform a computation in a large enough computational space and we will low enough error in order to observe a quantum speed up experimentally. That's our challenge for many groups and companies all around the world. And now what we would like to discuss today is can we formulate a problem that it is hard for a classical computer but easy to address for a quantum one and then go into the lab and demonstrate this experimentally. And this is where the concept of quantum supremacy is introduced. The term quantum supremacy was introduced by John Preskill, that's a tweet 
by John Preskill a few years ago, where he proposed quantum supremacy to identify controlled quantum systems surpassing the classical ones. I would like to point out that quantum supremacy is a problem for experimentalists. In the sense that as theoreticians, you really have algorithms which are able to outperform the classical counterpart. But now the question is, can we move to the lab and can we implement this machine in a regime where really we observe the speed up? Uh, this, uh, the quantum supremacy has attracted a, a strong interest now since uh, several years, few years. And I will suggest you the following uh, um, review paper, which is the quantum computational supremacy published in Nature a few years ago, which provide you a comprehensive theoretical analysis on the subject from a more compu computer science perspective. And as a comment from this abstract, a key milestone in, the field of, in this field will be when a universal quantum computer performs a computational task that is beyond the capability of any classical computer, an event known as quantum supremacy. And the reason why it is also very relevant, this milestone from a fundamental perspective is that achieving the quantum supremacy regime will be a way to disprove the extended church turing thesis, which claims that everything feasibly computable in the physical world is feasibly computable by probabilistic Turing machine. Once you're able to achieve quantum computational supremacy, you will have a new class of machine that are able to, to run and which are not equivalent via polynomial resources to a probabilistic Turing machine. You see, a key point of quantum supremacy is that when you deal with quantum supremacy, unlike most algorithmic tasks, you are not only interested in what you can do with the quantum hardware, you are also interested to compare it with what you can do with the classical hardware. So you need to carry out both analyses and then compare them. So one may think how we can identify an experimental demonstration of quantum supremacy. Let me comment that now quantum supremacy has been replaced also with the term quantum advantage. In, in my talk, I will be using the two terms and they will later on more comment on that. So in order to achieve quantum supremacy, quantum advantage, you need the following key ingredients. First, you will have to identify a computational problem whose complexity scales exponentially with a classical hardware, but only polynomially when using quantum devices. Second point, you need to have a classical benchmarking. You will have to address this problem with the best classical algorithm so as to find somehow a threshold over which you can claim to achieve the quantum advantage regime. Third, you need to carry out an experimental demonstration. You need to build the machine and run the machine. And then you need to implement the quantum instance on a system large enough to surpass the classical threshold. Finally, the fourth ingredient is the validation. You need to develop suitable tools to validate that indeed everything is going as expected. So keep in mind, we have these four ingredients and we will see how you can address these four ingredients today with the Photonics platform. Let me now comment a bit more on the name quantum supremacy, quantum advantage. There was a debate in the community whether supremacy was the right term. This is a, 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 an editorial on nature on this point because somehow the supremacy term may have a negative interpretation. There was a long debate. I'm here comment referring to the blog of Scott Aronson to use some tweet from Anima Anankumar you have other opinions in the Wall Street Journal. So to summarize, that's a long story, but I would like to share this with you to provide you all the ingredients to make your own opinion. I will then use the two terms today because you will see part of also my own paper, I use the term quantum supremacy, but I'm currently having a transition into the quantum advantage term, but I would like only to give you so that you have the way to check how the community debated about this uh, point, which is relevant from an ethical perspective. 
So now let's go back to the review. I, I comment, I, I mentioned you this review. If you go to this review, which has some more computer science, which is a two main platform are uh, summarized. So one is Boston sampling, which is the goal of today's presentation. The second one is random quantum circuits. But on same thing, we will see photons which propagate, interfere, while random quantum circuits, if you, you may foresee it as a kind of circuital counterpart of boson sampling. You don't have bosons, you have qubit, you don't have beam splitter, you have gates, and so on. But the two topics are very much related. You, you are aware that random quantum circuits were exploited by Google to demonstrate quantum supremacy one year ago, I will have only a couple of slides on that, but I wanted to highlight that the two topics are really strongly interconnected. And the four criteria that I mentioned before holds for the two scenario. But Boston Scientific was the first scheme which was proposed. This is why I will focus, and also because I must, first of all, I'm a photonic guy, and so obviously I will stick to my platform. So this was, this is a scenario. And okay, so I, I mentioned before, this was the computer science introduction, a really brief one. And now we will see that you will, I'm now mentioning all the platform uh, on quantum technologies. This is taken by the Twitter account Pascal of the society in France. But you may see that we will to, today focus on the photon side, on the right side. But we will see that this is deeply interconnected also with the random quantum circuit, which was undertaken with a superconducting platform, which is instead the red blocks. So this was the framework. What we want to answer the following question, how to achieve quantum supremacy. And the strategy I'm going to describe today used boson sampling. So I will first now briefly introduce boson sampling, which task is it? It's the following. You have n bosons. The n bosons are indistinguishable, for instance, photons. They are not interacting. You only have the indistinguishability. These n bosons propagate over m optical modes. These m optical modes may be some optical waveguides. Light propagating these waveguides. These waveguides are highly interconnected. Light will interfere, will propagate. We will have some condition which relates the number of modes and the number of photons. And then your final goal is to measure the output state. More precisely, your goal is to sample from the output distribution. And then we get the name boson sampling because you sample the dynamics of the bosons. Let me clarify, you are not reconstructing the output state. You are only measuring it and sampling the output distribution. This is the goal. So you give me the, bosons, the number of bosons, you give me the optical modes, you give me the description of the evolution, that is a unitary transformation, and then my goal is to sample from the output state. And now you can ask the first question. That's the first criteria. Is this task easy classically? So can a classical computer can efficiently sample from the output state of this distribution? The answer is no. Why the answer is no? Because there is a 95 long page papers by Scott Aronson and Lasser Akipov, which really in the details show you that this is very, very, very unlikely. In which sense? This is a common point of the quantum supremacy. You don't want to try only one classical algorithm. You would like to identify some problem where you expect that no classical efficient solution exists. And to this purpose, you have to develop a kind of transformation which has the following approach. If boson sampling would be easy classically, this would imply some very bad consequence for computer scientists. You will have what they call collapse of hierarchy of classic complexity, which is something which is very, very implausible. This means that the demonstration of the classical complexity is not based on the fact that they tried once, it's not working. It's really based on an in-depth analysis. 
So first po point number one, boson sampling is hard classically. Second point, so we will see, ask ourselves why is, is it hard classically? The main reason is that you have bosons which are indistinguishable and then you need to symmetrize the wave function. To symmetrize the wave function, you need to calculate the permanent of squared matrices and calculating the, square, the, the permanent of squared matrices with complex coefficient is something which scales exponentially with the dimension of the matrix. What is the permanent? You know the determinant. If you have a matrix two times two, A, B, C, D, the determinant is A, D minus B, C, the permanent is A, D plus B, C. If you have fermions, you deal with determinants. If you have bosons, you deal with permanents. Another key demonstration of the Aarons and Rackets for paper is not only that calculating exactly the permanent is an odd task. It's also an odd task to do it with some approximation. And that's another key ingredient because since you want to compare quantum hardware and classical hardware, and since you want to run a quantum hardware, your quantum hardware will be noisy. You will do your best, but noisy will be uh, intrinsic to an experiment. So if you want to compare the experiment with the classical counterpart, you must allow the classical counterpart also to be noisy. So their demonstration also consider approximate boson sampling on the classical counterpart. So this was boson sampling. Point one, it's hard classically. Point two, let's implement the boson sampling in the lab. What do we need? We need n photons, which must be indistinguishable. These n photons must propagate over m optical modes, as shown in the picture here. Light must interfere, and then you need to detect single photon. In principle, to implement this machine, you need a number of resources which scale polynomially. So we are on the game because classically it's exponential with the quantum hardware, it's polynomial. We have the ingredient to demonstrate quantum supremacy. Obviously it's not trivial. Especially in our, what we did in Rome to implement this unitary evolution, we exploited integrated photonics. So to summarize what is boson sampling and photons as the input, the evolution is a unitary operator and you measure a single photon on the output. Uh, let me try to summarize briefly. So before that, I showed you how may work a boson sampling machine. Let's now jump on, on how we implemented this in Rome. We exploited, this was a strong collaboration with the CNR in Milano, and we exploited integrated quantum photonics. In the specific case, what's adopt is a waveguide, which is fabricated using femtosecond laser writing. You have a, scribe, a substrate, a piece of glass. You focus a laser inside the substrate. The laser is pulsed, is slightly focused, and this allows you to write down, as shown here, oh, sorry. You can shine the laser on your substrate, and then you can write the waveguide which is embedded inside your materials. This is an animation which gives you an idea of how you can have, in this case, four optical modes. You see that sometimes the waveguides get closer, whereas the waveguides get closer, you have some splitter, which allows you to couple different waveguides. What else advantage of this approach? You may have chip with three dimensions. I will show you this later. You may have, these devices are not very compact, but it's very easy to couple light in and out. It's very easy to do prototyping, and then that's a good platform for a medium scale approach to quantum information. And now you can see another video we show you how is the fabrication in real time. So you see the substrate, you see uh, the microscope, you see a beam spot on the substrate. This is the laser that you are adopting to write the waveguide embedded in the material. I've shown already before this device. 
And now I would like somehow only to show you a bit of recipe of which devices we have implemented. So first step was to implement a directional coupler. You take two of guides, you browse the two of guides closer, and then you get the bit splitter. The following step, you can bring many bit splitter on the same chip and then implement some logical gate. It was also possible to implement a tunable wave plate on the chip, like Lambda over four, Lambda over two. And then you can also, on the same device, have many, many bit splitter as shown here on the left. And this allows you to have a kind of very large inter interconnected interferometer. This is what you need to implement your bosom sample. The previous device I've shown you were static device. So once you fabricate it, it stays forever. The following step, you would like to reconfigure your quantum hardware. And this can be done by writing the wave guide. You can put close to the surface a stripe of gold, you can locally eat your waveguides, and by locally eating your waveguide, you can change the index of refraction, and then you can change the phase, and this leads to a different unitary transformation. This was demonstrated first in a paper in 2015, where we had only one Max Zender interferometer, and then we had more complex uh, schemes with more phase shifter which allow it to have different phase shifter and a different control on your device. This is only a summary to show you somehow which kind of system you can implement with this platform. I also mentioned before that you can also have this waveguide on a three-dimensional uh, geometry. And this is a summary of some papers that we implemented. We implemented the tweeter, which is a generalization of a beam splitter to three modes, but you may have uh, other configurations, and today we will complete my presentation with the first results that we had in the, on the bosom sampling in the three-dimensional chip layout. So, uh, before making a small break, I would like to show you a simple animation to try to give you a real intuition on what means doing bosom sampling in the lab. If you want to do bosom sampling, you need to have single photon. In our experiments, we generated single photon using parametric down conversion, means by creating photon pairs. You take a UV pump B, you excite a nonlinear crystal here, and with a low probability, you create two pairs, four photons, so four yellow balls. So the yellow balls are the photons. You keep one yellow ball, one photon as a trigger of the experiment, and you are left with three photons. These three photons now are separated. They are injected in single mode fiber. And since you want this single photon to be indistinguishable, you need to synchronize all the wave packet in order to ensure the indistinguishability between the wave packets. This has a delay line. Our wave packet have a length of something like 150 femtoseconds. You synchronize the three photons, and with a fiber array, you inject now your single photons in the integrated chip. This is a chip that we've seen before, and this is a chip which is implementing the unitary transformation. This is where life will evolve. We have uh, here, you see the superposition principle, if you want. So the splitting of the photons is only a way to represent that you have different path interference and you get the chip, and on the output of the chip, you have an either fiber arrays. Now, with the fiber arrays, connect all your output to a set of single photon detectors, which can count zero or one. Grab the bunch of detector, you measure zero and one, you detect the electronic signal, and then you elaborate. And now what you are doing here, you are sampling from the output state. You are measuring the output state, you are sampling from the output distribution, you are generating a string, and this is a sampling of the output states. And then what you do, you register your output on your computer. In this case, we have 13 photons, 13 modes, sorry, three photons. So you get a string of 10, zero, and three, one, and you repeat and you repeat, and this is how it works. 
So my goal was really to provide you a visual scheme of boson sampling. And I guess now it's a good moment if you have any question for a small break. Yeah, Fabio, um, we, we have uh, one or two questions. Um, and let me start with the first one. Um, and that uh, you had, you, you were quoting that uh, mathematical computer science uh, inspired more from a review from the computer science side. Um, and actually the abstract was, uh, was defining uh, quantum supremacy as a universal quantum computer that performs that and that task. So how serious do you take that universal quantum computer in that sentence? That's a good point in question. So when you talk about that's a good question, because indeed that is what is right. When you consider quantum supremacy, you are not asking your device to be a universal quantum computer. If you want, it's a milestone in this direction, but to achieve quantum supremacy, you need to have programmability because you need to encode your input, but you don't need to be universal quantum computer. Okay, thanks. So, um, if, sorry, I, I, I think I interrupted you. You wanted. No, that was the point. Okay. I, so, thanks for the question. Okay, good. Um, and then, then another one, uh, and that would be is there something like fermion sampling also? Thanks for the question. So, that's an interesting point. You may have. Um, let me jump to the right slide using my... But the key point is the following, that when you have fermions, to evaluate fermions, you need determinants, and determinants may be efficiently approximated. So fermion sampling will be easy classically, and the reason is that determinant and permanent have different mathematical properties. And this difference sometimes uh, so also may arise when you go from an exact solution to an approximate solution, but it should say that the, the key point is that you have a permanent and not a determinant. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we asked uh, the rest of the uh, questions at the end. Makes more sense. Thank you so much. So now I want to now to, the two questions are perfectly on, on we, we are on board, we are, and now the key point is I've shown you the, the setup and I can show you the result of our first paper in 2014. So in our first paper, we were doing a small boson sampling. We were not alone, we were four simultaneous paper. For instance, the first graph is three photon seven modes. Your rimbus space is very small and you, it's so small that you can really reconstruct the whole output state. You can, you can repeat the experiment many, many times. You can measure all the probability. You can do the classical simulation. You can compare experiment and theory. So this is different boson sampling side, but this graph somehow give you a wrong intuition because when boson sampling becomes interesting, the Hilbert space is so large that you're not able to measure any probability. You get only a sparse set of data inside the new Hilbert space. So now I wanted to be to summarize the evolution of boson sampling. So this is back to 2018. We have the conceptual paper in 2011. The first four paper in 2013. Then many groups started working on it. This is summarizing not all the contribution worldwide. And then you had some variant of boson sampling. For instance, scatter shot done in Rome. You had reconfigurable sequence. More recently, they adopted not the single photons were generated using quantum dot. For instance, this layout here is the one used by John Pan in China. And you have a similar apparatus adopted by Pascal Snellar together with Andrew White. And the goal was to have more photons, more modes. Because this is now 2019. This is a paper again by John Pan, again using quantum dot. What they do, they use one quantum dot, which create 20 photons over a different time. Then you have a time spatial demultiplexer and you move the photons from a different time to a different position. And this is done here with this demultiplexer. And then you inject your device. In this way, you can have a good long stream of single photons which are indistinguishable. Then you can inject in your 
uh, unit are evolution and you can measure the output state. And this paper largely announced uh, the weight. Then you had this tweet. This tweet was in 2019 by Yang Lu that was announcing 30, 50 photons and it will require as few slides to get to this number done by Chaoyang Lu and Chan Weipan in China. What, does it, what was the technological now challenge with boson sensing? If you want to have quantum supremacy, you need more photons, you need more optical modes, you may need have alternative schemes. I've shown you boson sensing, but we have other variants. And now this implies several challenges, some technological one on the sources, the manipulation, the detection. And you have also some fundamental questions on the theory side. May we find out some other schemes which make life easier for experimentalists? How we can exploit boson sampling for hybrid algorithm? What is the impact of noise and imperfection? How can you certify that the boson sampling is working properly? Remember, this was my criteria number four when I tried to show you what is the recipe to identify a quantum supremacy experiment. This is now to show you some variants of boson sampling. We have seen what we call today the standard boson sampling. The standard boson sampling is one where you start from four states, single photon, which are evoluted via linear unitary transformation. Another version is the scattershot boson sampling, where now you have many, many sources which exploit parametric down conversion, you don't fix what is your input state. At each run of the experiment, you will have a different input state. This is named scattershot boson sampling. And the advantage is that it leads to an increase of the sampling rate. And then we have a Gaussian boson sampling. What is a Gaussian boson sampling? It's a boson sampling where the input state is not the Fox state, it's a squeeze, the single mode squeezer. So to carry out Gaussian boson sampling, you need many, many squeezers, which in are injected in your unitary evolution. And at the end, you measure single photon states in the output. Since you are now exploiting squeezer at the input, you are not fixing the number of input photons because squeezer superposition is number of, of photon numbers. You are not fixing the number of photons. The number of photons will change shot by shot. But this, as I will show you, this is the approach that is adopted to demonstrate quantum advantage a few months ago. So again, I repeat different variants. Some elements are common, some other are instead different. And now back to the, this experiment. This is experiment which was published in China in uh, December on quantum computational advantage using photons. And this uh, experiment adopted by Zhang Weipan adopted single mode squeezer in the input evolution and the single photon measurement. So this is a Gaussian boson sampling. So let me try to show you here what are the different recipe of the experiment. You can see on the left side, a comparison between boson sampling and Gaussian boson sampling to make the statement very clear. In boson sampling, single photon states. In Gaussian boson sampling, single mode squeezed vacuums. So you need many, many squeezing sources. Moreover, since you are using squeezing, you are sensible to the phase. So all your apparatus must be phase locked because the phase relation between the different modes is relevant. So you have many, many squeezers, up to 50 squeezers, and all the, these 50 squeezers must be phase locked because your state is sensible to, phase, to such any change in the phase. Then in their apparatus, they had a linear evolution, which was implemented via low, low loss interferometer. This low loss interferometer was overall able to couple 50 spatial modes, each one with two polarization, which at the end leads to 100 optical modes. See low loss interferometer at low loss to, get, to enable high detection rate, but uh, 
the de this device was not reconfigurable. At least only one part was reconfigurable. And finally, they had to measure 100 output volts, and this was done with superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. I repeat, this is their paper. I know I'm trying to go back. So you see now here, I wanted to show you the picture of the experiment here, which is, as you may see, impressive. And on the right side, you may see what is the dimension of the output space. And uh, in blue, you may see all the previous bosom sampling experiment included our experiment in Rome. You see in violet, the previous experiment based on quantum dot, and you see on red, the hyperspace dimension they could achieve in this science paper, the overall hyperspace dimension was 10 to the power of 30. Essentially, why it is so large? Because this is, is uh, this dimensionality is essentially on fitting on average 50 modes, 50 photons over 100 modes. But since you have squeezer, the number of photons is not even fixed. Each time you run the machine, you get a different number of photons. And this is what leads you to this huge hyperspace. This is, we are back to this conceptual scheme of what was the apparatus. And this is now a picture, a drawing taken from their paper. We show how the different photons were injected in the apparatus, how they were synchronized, and then how they were coupled in this, uh, in this scheme. So this result was published in December. Okay, so that's again another picture from their apparatus and the credit is only to their group. But now we, so we have seen the scheme, how you can implement it, how it is added classically. We have, we have seen how it can be realized, what are the technological challenges. And now we have a last question, how you can validate the output state. And this is a key point because Imagine when you do boson sampling, but also when you do random quantum circuits, these problems are hard to, 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 to carry out, but they are also hard to verify. It's not like factorization. If you factorize a number, the factorization is hard, but you can easily verify your question. This is not happening here. So you need to validate, develop some tools which provide you a strong evidence that indeed you are implementing the right scheme and that what you are implementing is not feasible classically. Because what is the key point? You may have noise in your apparatus. You may have partial distinguishability. All this will move your sampling task closer to a classical simulation. You need to identify a boundary and this is why validating your apparatus in the proper way, it's a key ingredient. And I will say it's still an open question because what you can do at the end is only to provide a stronger and stronger evidence that everything is going as expected. So in this slide, I wanted to summarize you a bit what, what validation scheme we have developed in the last few years. You may have two different approach, a physical approach and the computational one where you try to identify some strong signature, which provide you the confirmation that everything is going as expected. And uh, I'm not going too much into the details here because I wanted to show you some last results that we have, but I guess this is a, a key point, which is right now for any quantum supremacy experiment, you, you have different points because when you typically, you compare your quantum results with a classical counterpart, and you may find a huge gap. But then maybe you, if you try, if you ask your quantum simulator to also be noisy, like your quantum apparatus, your gap between classical and quantum can be reduced. So the, the capability to validate properly the output is strongly related on how strong is your claim of quantum advantage. Uh, we developed recently, I mean, I don't want now to, to go too much into these details. We also recently adopted some machine learning techniques for the validation. But I wanted today to show you uh, a recent results that we, we have, which try now to increase the number of modes with a programmable approach. 
And so for this purpose, we recently adopted the boson sampling using a three-dimensional layout. So instead of having a planar configuration of waveguides, you have a bundle of waveguides which are counted in a random way via a three-dimensional geometry, as shown here. So recently we implemented a 32 modes boson sampling with a continuous coupling. And the advantage is that it minimizes propagation losses and it allows you to cover a larger Hilbert space. So this will apparatus. We are still using parametric down conversion. The evolution is done on these 32 wave guides with three dimensionality, and we have a, a, a avalanche photodiode detector on the output. This is the scheme. With, uh, we have these 32 modes with uh, device. On the output, you have a fiber array that you can directly put in contact with your chip. And this is now how you can implement with your, your bottom sample. This was the first step. Now, what we did, we then verified that what we obtain is indeed a random matrix according to the R random distribution. And now, what we have been doing now is the following step where this 3D layout also have a cap capability to, be re to have some, recon some reconfigurability. So where you have some thermal controller which allows you then to modify a unitary transformation in this three-dimensional layout. So you have now one fixed chip with these 32 modes, but you have this capability to change your unitary transformation. I would like also mention that also Boson Sampling with the 3D layout was carried out by this other group in China, by Xian Minji. In this case, the 3D layout was a fixed, so it was not configurable, it was a fixed transformation. I'm also almost over with my time, I want to respect the 45 minutes. So only to mention, we have been discussing Boson Sampling, I would like to conclude with two slides on the experiment to Google, where they had a random quantum circuit. And I would like simply to show you that this random quantum circuit is very strongly connected to a boson sampling. Now the difference is that your evolution is done on qubit states. You have single qubit logical gates, two qubit logical gates. You measure on the output your, what is coming out from your apparatus. You get a string of zero and one. And again, the challenge is how you can validate the output state. So this is similar to the bottom sampling, but the difference is that now your input is a unitary evolution, the qubit, and you will implement the unitary transformation using one qubit gate and two qubit gates. And very close to the end, why do we believe this experiment has significance? I will say I'm, I'm quoting here the paper by Google. I will say for three reasons. From a computer science perspective, from a physicist perspective, and from a quantum engineering perspective. Quantum engineering, because you're developing this hardware. Physics, because you show for the first time that you have the capability to control a triangle, a huge Hebrew space. And from the computer science perspective, you, you suggest that finally you can this proof the extended church doing thesis. Finally, I'm almost over. It's on what are the potential application of boson sampling. You see on the left side the paper by on the quantum computational advantage using photons. So there are several schemes which try to use Gaussian boson sampling for solving computational problems. In particular, this layout has been adopted by the company Xanadu in Canada, which is very actively working in this framework. This means that the results are coming out on a very monthly basis almost. You have several ideas. Now the key point is to see how, which, how really all this algorithm compared to the classical counterpart because each time you go into technical details, finding out how this algorithm speed up with respect to the classical counterpart, it's always one of the main more technical points. 
Uh, I would like to show this picture taken again by um, a Twitter account. We show that we are now in the Nisk Valley out of the classical world. The goal of someone is to get the fortress of fault tolerance. We are here, we are between the desert and the valley. And the goal is to still advance the technology. And from my perspective, this challenge of quantum advantage is a way to try to define some really precise benchmark to which you should compare and to try to identify what are the key ingredients which make this experiment strong from a quantum perspective. And I guess that this is everything. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Fabio. Thank you for this great talk. Um, we have quite some questions. Um, and let me just um, start right away. So we have one um, from Pedro Mendes. Could you explain in general how one knows how many times we must sample so that we have the distribution? 100 times, 1,000 times, or as many as we can? So let me try. Thank you for the question, because it's something which I not commented explicitly. Let me show you the plot of distribution. What is the key point? is that when you increase the number of modes and the number of, of photons, your Eber space dimension is increasing exponentially. This means that here you can see the distribution. If we go to the paper, to Chan Repan, let's see this plot here. The Eber space dimension is 10 to the 30. Okay, this means that if you would like to reconstruct here the distribution probability, you will need to repeat your experiment of the order of 10 to the 30 times. And I guess this would require something maybe like 10 to the 25 seconds, which I guess it's long. So when you consider boson sampling in a regime of quantum advantage, you will never be able to reconstruct the distribution probability. And the same arguments holds for the paper of Google. In their case, the dimension was sent to the 16. So you will never be able to reconstruct the world distribution. You are only sampling for it. Now the point is with one million cent sample, with one giga sample over a space of 10 to the 30, how can I certify that everything is going properly and that indeed, I, my evolution is truly quantum. I hope I addressed the question properly. Yeah, thank you, I think so. Uh, maybe a follow-up because you are mentioning now the Google experiment with qubits. Um, and you said the Hilbert space dimension was what, 10 to the 16, I think? What? Yes. Yeah, so, so and uh, in, the, in, the, in this Chinese uh, photon sampling one, it was 10 to the 30, right? So is, the question is, if you just take log two of 10 to the 30, you end up with 100. Uh, that would suggest 100 qubits, kind of, right, to get the same dimension. So now the question yeah. is, uh, can you really compare the Chinese experiment uh, to a 100 qubit quantum advantage experiment, or is one of the others more or less powerful? No, thank you for the question, because it was something I wanted to comment. No, they are not equivalent at all. I fully agree. In the sense, I give this number because this gives you an idea on how your data living in huge Eber space, but it's completely different. Why? Because here the dynamics of the particle is connected by a transformation, limit I transformation, which is a matrix of dimension 100 by 100. This means that the dynamics of this experiment is described by, by 10,000 para complex parameter. So the Eber space is larger than the one with qubit, when the parameter which identifies your dynamics are much slower. So I, one of my comments for the audience is that, oh, sometimes there is this mapping one photon one qubit. It's, this mapping is only going in some specific scenario. One photon is not one qubit. One photon, we, have to, we are talking about photons, modes, number, occupation, and seeing what is the right isomorphism between the two will change scenario by scenario. To try to come back to your question, 
I, I guess we cannot compare the two scenario. This is one number. I guess the second number is to identify how many parameters you need to describe the general evolution on your system. In this case, it's 10,000 complex parameters. If you have 100 qubits, it will be much more. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so then, uh, well, maybe another question concerning the um, uh, scattershot boson sampling versus uh, Gaussian boson sampling. And the question is, how far is scattershot boson sampling from a quantum advantage compared to Gaussian boson sampling? Thank you for the question. So let me go back to this. Uh, there are some subtleties. So when you talk scattershot boson sampling, you can consider it from a quantum optics perspective as a two-mode squeezer with low gain. And if you consider scattershot boson sampling, having 50 photons with a scattershot boson sampling is, is much harder than with Gaussian. Why? Because with Gaussian boson sampling, you can increase the gain of your squeezer. By increasing the gain of your squeezer, you may increase how many photons are detected. On the other side, the complexity proof which tells you that this problem is hard to address, these are more, co are more developed for scattershot boson sampling. Because at the end, scattershot boson sampling is the kind of extension of the standard boson sampling. So from some perspective, scattershot, you have some much stronger uh, theoretical analysis. To summarize, I believe that to demonstrate quantum advantage with scattershot boson sampling, would require an EV integrated approach where everything is on chip. Maybe with, I would say, 400 moles for the unitary operator, 400 squeezer on chip. With this scenario, you may get quantum advantage with scattershot boson sample. But this is a rough estimate, so you should not really take my number as an absolute uh, threshold to, to be fulfilled. Okay, thank you. And maybe to, to, to clarify on that, because of you mentioned the number of photons, the number of modes, right? Maybe, can you say how the complexity actually scales with, with, with either of the two? So, thanks also for that. So, there are two points. Uh, the key ingredient is the number of photons. Why? Because it's the number of photons which give you the dimension of the permanent. And this is where is the hardness. So if you have many, many moles and few photons, maybe you, I, you can, I cannot find it, but in principle, you may have a fast solution. So the number of photons give you this ingredient and where it enters the number of moles, the number of moles in the Aaron's and the for paper uh, it enter in some assumption, which relates the number of moles and number of photons. Whether you may relax this assumption is still a source of debate. Something that, for instance, you would like is that the number of modes is larger than the number of photons to the square. Because when you're in this condition where m is larger than n to the square, at the end, in the output, you may neglect the case where two photons are coming out together. And then it's, it's enough to have detector which can count zero or one. Again, so you may see, to summarize, the key ingredient is number of photons, Wise number of moles enter in several technicalities, either from the theoretical point of view, either from the experimental side. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe another question concerning this uh, uh, Gaussian boson sampling. And uh, that is basically, you, you, you mentioned the importance of squeeze states and you basically now also highlighted that because of you said, right, it's important to have many photons in the game. Um, but there's also, of course, something like a phase to squeeze states. So the question is, what's the role of uh, phase, sensi uh, phase sensitivity of squeeze states in the Gaussian boson sampling? Thank you. The point is that this is entering uh, somehow in the noise of the experiment. So why when you have Fox state at the beginning, you have, you have no phase relation, when you have squeezed sources, you have a phase relation. And this is why in this experiment, everything had to be phase locked. 
um, what is the impact of noise in the face? That will change your squeezed state, maybe a bit more mixed, and then you are going towards the classical domain. Where is the boundary? It's not easy to see. So what is the noise in the face that you can tolerate? I cannot answer you, but somehow you are going in the wrong direction. So in this scenario, everything was face locked. Where is the boundary? Uh, it's a more technical question, and I guess it's giving the, the overall answer is a bit more complex. Okay, thanks. That clarifies this, I think. So um, one more is, you mentioned propagation losses through your, I think in context of your 3D structure, but of course everything has propagation losses. Uh, so um, so how, can you give a typical number for the, for the photon throughput efficiency of these setups? And, and also what is limiting it? And then the question is, in which sense is this a problem? Okay, so um, the, the losses enter in several point of view. So first that obviously when you have losses, this decreases your detected rate. And since you want to detect many photons, and so if you have a detection efficiency, which is eta, and you want to detect any photons, the probability to get n photons is n to the power of n. So the impact is large. And this is the key difference that we see between all the previous experiment of quantum. Because everything was bulk, they generated the squeezing, they injected directly. The interference was so lost, high coupling with the detector. If I'm right, the overall transmission was something like 60, 70 percent, which is an impressive number. If you consider instead all the previous experiment, here the losses were much more, much more higher because to generate, you go in a fiber, you go in a chip. So typically all these experiment, some are better, some are worse are the losses between maybe a transmission, maybe it was between 5% to 20% overall. And that's a, a strong impact on what is the detected rate. And then there is another point on losses, which is also very relevant which is also not fully understood, is still part of investigation, is that uh, when you increase your losses again, somehow this allows you to have more efficient classical simulation. So somehow you may imagine that if you have n photons without having n photons, it's an n photons interference. When you start having losses, your output state will be like a contribution where you are interference between four, five, six, seven. And then it's a contribution where n photons interfere, it becomes small. And if the contribution where many photons interfere decrease, this makes the classical simulation easier. So somehow the overall transmission is something which play a key role on benchmarking your apparatus versus the classical counterpart. Then they found some threshold, I guess, uh, there are some very fundamental advances on that, but giving you the complete perspective on that point, it's, 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 it's again very technical, and then we say there is not yet a complete analysis that you can apply to any boson, boson sampling variants. Okay, thank you, very clear, thanks. Um, so I think we have two questions more. Um, so uh, concerning your 3D uh, <laughs> setup, um, is that basically squeezing the planar geometry just in a volume basically? Um, or do you also use beam splitters in there that have more than two entries and uh, two outputs? If so, is such a multi-port splitting architecture totally equivalent to the boson sampling in the planar case or not? So from, thank you for the question. From a conceptual perspective, having a 3D layout, you can describe it via unitary transformation. So any, anything that you can do 3D, you can do it planar in principle. Likely it will be long, it will be have more losses, it will be more noisy, but you can, there is a, a, in theory a perfect matching between the two. Here, having the 3D allows you to have all the modes which are interconnected on a smaller plane. 
no, I think I, I think that's I think that's fine. Uh, so so the last one uh, is about your last slide. Um, you showed some applications there, and the question is, uh, do they really need boson sampling, or is it uh, is is basically all that is required a revised uh, uh, nil uh, Laflamme Melbourne 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 uh, scheme where you only have photons, linear optics, and uh, detectors? So that's a very, so. We, let me uh, see if I can show you another slide. No, I don't have enough time, so I don't. I will answer in the following way. If you think the knil laflamme mibon scheme is something you have single photon, adaptive optics, adaptive, because you measure and you adapt. So it's an adaptive linear optics, while boson sampling is something which is not adaptive. So it's something which is in between, it's before KLAM scheme. If you take boson sampling and that measurement and adaptation, you get KLAM. So now the question is, before I go to KLAM, may I get something useful? So I, we know that if we have adaptation, we will get universal quantum computing. If I'm in between the two schemes, can I get some useful output? And this is the open question. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Fabio. Um, with this, uh, well, I cannot say more than thank you again also for this uh, extensive uh, question time and answering very precisely and uh, with this, I uh, hand back to Sebastian. Yeah, well, thank you very much also from my side, Fabio. This was an extremely clear talk. I really liked it. Uh, next week, I'd like to remind you guys that we will have yet another talk by Edvardas Narevicius, uh, who will talk about cold molecules, but not the ones you can build yourself. So these are actual molecules. And you should also check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow they will have Wolfgang Ketterle speaking about ultra-cold atoms and optical lattices. If you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com, subscribe to our email list and our Google calendar there. You can also follow us on Twitter. And we would like to thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.